everyone. My name is Pigeon Hawkins. My nickname comes from how pigeons typically thrive in even the most inhospitable environments and how I want to emulate that in my own day-to-day -day life. My working background ranges from customer service to telecommunications and management. After several years of working in the customer service sector, I decided to pivot my career into the IT world by taking this data analytics and Python course via Savvy Coders. I'm the type of person where if I've been having a lot of trouble solving a problem, when I finally get the answer, it's just like a huge celebration for me. So today is a big deal. My capstone today is going to be going over risk factors attributed to heart disease, and I'm going to be attempting to utilize those risk factors to set up some future health forecasting and see if we can use those factors to predict whether heart disease might occur in patients. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Okay, and can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, ma'am. Awesome, okay. So I'll just go ahead and move on. The first thing I wanted to go over was how I retrieved my data in the first place. And I retrieved it using the UCI Machine Learning Archive database. I received my heart disease data in a completely raw format, meaning I had to use Python code and Jupyter Notebook to organize the data, which was actually the most difficult part for me because my data was all crunched together. It didn't have column names, it had duplicates, it had null data, all sorts of stuff that I had to use these sections of Python code to fix, as you can see. I also utilized Panda, NumPy and Matplotlib to visualize my data before we had access to Tableau Public in class to kind of give myself an idea of what my data would tell me when I was trying to visualize it, which we'll see here on this next slide. Now, at the very beginning, because of those visualizations, I was thinking that age, resting blood pressure, cholesterol level, and maximum heart rate achieved would be my top four indicators of whether heart disease would occur. But after working with my data in Tableau, that changed over time. My next few slides after this one are all going to be dashboards that I've created in Tableau. And just to start my presentation off on a good foot, cardiovascular diseases are the leasing cause of death globally, with four out of five of those deaths being attributed to heart attacks or stroke. Heart attacks being blockage of blood flow to the heart and strokes being blockage of blood flow to the brain. By evaluating 10 different attributes or risk factors, I'm trying to identify which factors most commonly occur prior to disease diagnosis to allow for early treatment, early diagnosis, and allow for a greater number of saved lives. The first risk factor I'd like to go over with you is age group. In my data set, I had a total of 509 patients that were indeed diagnosed with heart disease. And the age group most affected by heart disease were in the 51 to 60 range with 223 of those patients out of 509 affected, followed closely by 61 to 77 at 161 patients out of 509. In this case, I decided to go with the very top number for each of my risk factors. So 51 to 60 were the ones that I stuck with throughout this. Next, I'd like to go over gender ratio. Now, my data set was curated in 1988, which is quite a long time ago, but this was the most comprehensive heart disease data set that was publicly accessible under the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, meaning it didn't have any identifying information that I could use to hurt people or use their information for illegal processes. So in this case, we have a large skew of male-dominated population in my set being 459 out of 509 to 50 female patients out of 509. After looking a little bit more into this time period, it turns out that prior to 1990, females were not necessarily required to be included in medical studies that did not indicate or require reproductive services. So they weren't necessarily always included in heart disease studies or any other medical studies as well. So I decided that gender wasn't a good indicator in this case of whether heart disease ac adequately affected the female population due to that happening in that time period. Uh, next, I'd like to go over blood sugar levels by age group. 
I did have 94 out of 509 patients present with elevated blood sugar levels, meaning that they were greater than 120 milligrams per deciliter. Now, again, the age ranges affected were 51 to 60 most of the time, followed closely by 61 to 77. And in the case of heart disease, too much sugar in your system can weaken the elasticity of the vessels in your heart and also cause widespread inflammation. But due to the fact that blood sugar itself is typically a large indicator for several other diseases, such as diabetes and obesity, I decided that this one also wasn't a good running candidate for deciding on whether heart disease would be predictable. So we'll move on to the next set. Next, we'll talk about average blood pressure. Now in blood pressure, typically you would have both a systolic, meaning the pressure that your heart exerts during a heartbeat at its maximum, or diastolic pressure, which is the pressure in your arteries of your heart between heartbeats, uh, which is normally where you hear the 120 over 80 number. But in this data set, they only gave us the systolic pressure. So we'll be focusing on whether patients had a larger than usual pressure within their heart per beat. Normally you would want a 120 or less blood pressure systolically and anything above that would be considered elevated and anything above 130 would start putting you into hypertension stage one, two, or a hypertensive crisis. Now high blood pressure can damage your arteries, again, making them less elastic and it can also decrease your blood flow to the heart and throughout your circulatory system. In my data, the most affected group again was 51 to 60, and we had quite a few people having high blood pressure, but the most common blood pressure, the most common denominator here, were blood pressures in the 140 to 179 ranges, which is hypertension stage two, meaning there is a lack of blood through throughout the body and that your arteries are being damaged with 192 out of 509 patients presenting with that blood pressure above 140. So I chose this as one of my high tier indicators of heart disease in the case of um, hospital admission. Next, we'll go over average cholesterol levels. Uh, 299 out of 509 patients presented with cholesterol levels that were above 200 milligrams per deciliter. When we're talking about cholesterol, we typically have serum levels of two different kinds of cholesterol in the blood. One being LDL, which is low density lipoprotein, which is most of the time called the bad cholesterol in the blood system. That's the cholesterol that builds up plaque in your heart and reduces the ability for blood to flow throughout the body. And then we also have the serum level of HDL, which is high density lipoprotein, which is the good cholesterol. That cholesterol actually attaches to LDL and then flushes it out through the liver. So most of the time, doctors want you to have a high HDL level and a low LDL level. In this study, we had a composite score of both of those cholesterol levels in the blood. So anything above 150 milligrams per deciliter is considered to be very high cholesterol level and will cause that plaque buildup within the heart and contribute to heart disease. We did have quite a few people in the 51 to 60 age ranges in both Europe and the United States that were affected with blood uh, cholesterol levels higher than 200, going all the way up to the 600s, but those were typically outliers as you can see. We had very little of the 500 to 600 levels, which is good because we don't want to see that in the case of heart disease. And a lot of the reason why this might have happened during the late 1980s time period is because there was a restaurant franchise war between McDonald's and Burger King going on at this time. Those restaurants were very fastly expanding across the United States and Europe in what we call the burger wars today. So we must have had a lot of people eating more burgers, greasy fat food, and raising their cholesterol levels during this time period, which is probably why we had 200 milligrams per deciliter and above being the common denominator here. Next, we have EKG results upon hospital admission, which are these little sections here at the bottom, and then maximum heart rate achieved during the exercise tests after the initial EKG results. Normal heart rate is about 120 beats per minute for most people. And as you can see, heart rate 
achieved was all over the board. So I didn't find that maximum heart rate achieved was a good indicator of heart disease itself. But the initial EKG results automatically show either a mild abnormality or a left ventricular hypertrophy, meaning a swelling within the wall of the heart that would keep it from pumping normally. 201 out of 509 of my patients presented with those mild or obvious abnormalities of the ventricular system or that thickening of the heart's main pumping chamber. Therefore, this one is also one of my top tiers for deciding whether a patient might have heart disease in future. We also have angina types. Angina is chest pain. Whenever I was going over my findings here, a good majority of my patients were asymptomatic for angina or chest pain, meaning they did not experience any sort of pain related to their heart disease diagnosis. And every one of my patients were indeed diagnosed with heart disease. We had three that had typical angina, meaning they had pain within their chest. Nine that were atypical angina, meaning that they had pain that fluctuated in their chest either getting worse or getting less over time. And then 37 that had non-anginal pain, meaning that they had pain in other areas of their bodies that weren't necessarily in the chest region. Because we only had 49 out of 509 patients present with symptomatic angina, this is also not a good indicator of heart disease. And our last risk factor is ST slope. ST slope, uh, when you have a normal segment, it has a slight upward concavity, meaning it slopes upward just slightly, kind of in a soft curve. Uh, anything that is flat, down sloping, or depressed would indicate coronary ischemia, meaning you have reduced blood flow through your circulatory system and through your coronary arteries. Any elevation above this slight upward concavity would indicate a total blockage of the coronary artery and that your heart muscle is currently dying. In this data set, luckily we had not as many upward elevation slopes, which is great because that means that their heart muscles weren't necessarily dying at the time, but the most common denominator here was the flat downsloping or depressed segment, meaning that they did have lack of blood flow to their heart muscle and through their arteries and circulatory system. We had 206 patients out of 509 that so showed with a flat ST slope, and that indicates that they have heart disease. So by breaking all of that data down, I broke it down into the top five risk factors in order of patient presentation. If they have cholesterol above 200 milligrams per deciliter, again, clogging their arteries. If they are in the age group of 51 to 60, if they have a flat ST slope indicating ischemia or lack of blood flow through the circulatory system or their heart, their initial EKG results showing either mild abnormalities of their arteries or if they have left ventricular hypertrophy, which is swelling of the walls of the heart, or if they have systolic blood pressure greater than 140, which of course that's the maximum pressure the heart exerts during a heartbeat. Typically, the prime candidate in the 1980s would have presumably shown all five of these symptoms. And my attempt in this presentation was to show that we could use different risk factors or different symptoms to help deduce whether a patient will have these symptoms. In future, I would like to continue my dive into this data along with the lifestyle habits around the 1980s time period to confirm what could be exacerbating all of these symptoms, along with garnering a more recent heart disease data set to see what has changed over the years, such as different medical treatments, different risk factors or measured symptoms that they might not have had access to in the 80s. And I would also like to increase my health forecasting knowledge and work towards using data and machine learning to save lives if possible. And of course, if you are interested, here is the web link to the UCI machine learning database archive where I received my data and I was required to put this on here because they do require if you're going to publish that you put the doctor's names that originally curated the data in the late 1980s and my ancillary web links that I used to um, study for this, as well as learn more about each of my risk factors one by one. I would like to thank everybody for coming to see my demonstration today, and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. 
My name is Michael. My interest in technology came at a young age. My mom took C++ class and I picked up her textbook and tried to replicate some code. Whenever my mom and someone in the family got a new laptop, I was always the one to unbox it and set it up for them. I became the family and friends IT guy. Once I graduated high school, I went to work for Converters as an internet support rep. I became really good at listening to someone's problem and troubleshooting and resolving the issue in a timely manner timely and courteous, courte courteous manner. My capstone project centers around the impact of headphones on hearing. Let me show you what I have created. All right, I am bringing this up now. Sorry. Gotta make sure it's still open. This is my story. Trying to move the camera around so I can get it out the way. All right, let me see. All right, are you guys able to see the uh, Tableau presentation? Yes. Okay. All right. And are you able to see the PowerPoint as well? Cannot see the PowerPoint. I can just see oh, your presentation. Well, I'll bring it. I'll bring it up after I finish with the uh, okay the tableau. But this is um, this is uh, the impact of headphones on hearing. Um, so let me give you guys just a, a little bit before I get into it, um, so you won't be confused. Um, <laughs> all right. So first, the role of headphones. Headphones cause damage to your ears the same way other loud noises do resulting in audiologists calling noise-induced hearing loss. Um, over time, the sounds from headphones cause hair cells in the cochlea to bend down too much, too severely, if they don't get time to recover the damage and be permanent. However, headphones don't have to be extremely loud to damage your ears. Even listening to headphones or earbuds at a moderate volume can damage your hearing over time. That's because your ears are not just damaged by the loudness of a noise, but by the length of the exposure as well. That's the same reason going to a concert or using loud power tools can damage your ears as much as louder, gunshots, or explosions. The duration of exposure matters just as much as the volume. So my first uh, Tableau page was is just the showing that um, I was showing all the groups. I'm trying to see if I can go down. This is blocking it, but let me see. Rest of all right. There we go. All right, so when I go to deadly range where, where iPhones are listed, not deadly range, but dangerous range. Here we go. AirPods, they're right next to power saws, rap concerts, lawnmowers, weed whackers, and hand drills. So usually what that means is um, if you're listening to your, your AirPods or headphones, for at least seven minutes at 100% volume, you can lose your hearing over time. They said over time in about 30, 30 days in your cochlea, they don't heal, heal properly. So on this screen, that's what I was just, just showing. All right, let me get back to this. There we go. All right. <sighs> What I, found, what I found great is that best moves decreased with distance. The closer you are to the source of sound, the louder it is. For the reason of many audiologists and hearing experts, they recommend over-the-ear headphones instead of in-ear models like earbuds. The extra distance between the speakers and the ear can, can significantly reduce the loudness in audio and help prevent hearing damage. As you can see, louder noises cause hearing damage much faster than quieter ones. But quiet ones can still cause damage over time. For instance, a 90 decimal noise about the same as a loud motorcycle approximately 30 feet away can cause hearing damage in under three hours. A sound about 105 decimals similar to a gas line or other power tools can cause damage to your hearing in about five minutes. What about headphones? Unfortunately, that question isn't easy to answer because it shows the decimal ratings of headphones vary because you have you have canal headphones and you have over the ear headphones and they also have Bluetooth headphones. So they haven't really gotten to all the headphones and how they can rate the damage to them. 
but the AirPods are the ones that they're focusing on. So, all right, going to the next slide. So, all right. All right, so what this graph shows, there were about 280 men and 270 women adolescents who were about 17 years of age. And this focused on the self-reporting data and subjective hearing problems, while the listening habits regarding portable music players with headphones. Uh, this results indicated that longer lifetime exposure in years increased listening frequency were associated with poor hearing thresholds with more self-reported hearing problems. A tendency was found for listening to louder volumes and poor hearing thresholds. Women reported more subjective hearing problems and compared with men, but exhibited better hearing thresholds. In contrast, men reported more use of portable music devices and they listened at higher volumes. Although the vast majority listened to a moderate sound level and for shorter periods of time, the study also indicates that there is a subgroup of 10% that listened to, that listened to between 90 and 100 decimal for longer periods of time, even during sleep. So that group might be at risk for developing future noise and induced hearing impairments. And for my last slide, this was the, some Swedish adolescents that were, um, that were listening to personal music devices, hearing and related exposure sound levels. And it shows in this, 68% um, of them were using canal phones and 32% of them were using headphones. So all the, it shows the issues that they came up with, like distortion, muffled sounds, noise sensitivity, poor hearing, tendonitis, and tired of sounds. As you can see, um, the group that listened to it at zero to 85 decimals, only one of them had a distortion issue. But the group that listened to the sounds levels between 85 and 100, none of them had any issues. So, it shows, even though it's showing that uh, people that are listening to it at a lower sound, they ended up with more issues, um, which is kind of a good thing. So it's, it's been showing. So if you're listening to it at a higher sound, the people, the adolescents that were, they, um, they still were having lower issues than the ones that were listening to it at a lower sound. So uh, and there we go. Let me go to this. All right, so how loud noises can damage your hearing? The key, the key danger of headphones is volume. The fact that they can, that the fact that they can produce very loud, very loud levels of sound very closely to your ear, this is dangerous for your hearing because loud noises in general are damaging to your ears. When the sound waves reach our ears, they cause the eardrum to vibrate. The vibration is transmitted to the inner ear through several small bones. When it reaches the, the cochlea, the cochlea is fluid filler chamber in your ear that contains many thousands of small hairs. When that vibration has reached the cochlea, the fluid inside, it vibrates and causes the hairs to move. The louder sounds cause stronger vibrations, which cause hairs to move more. When you listen to sounds that are too loud for too long, these hairs lose their sensitivity to vibration. Many loud noises cause the cells to bend or fold. This causes, this causes a sensation to temporary hearing loss. After you're exposed to loud noises, the hair takes time to recover from extreme vibrations caused the loud noises. And the time that they tried to come up with was about 30 days for your, for your ears to recover. So if you're, if you're constantly listening to sounds, your ears will never recover. So they said in about um, 40 years, this generation, most of them, they don't have the technology or the hearing aids to repair the hair. So that's about it for me. I know it was kind of short, but that was my capstone. So if you have any questions, I am here to answer. My name is Asta Makona. I was born and raised in Ethiopia. I have been in the US for the past 14 years. I have seven years of experience as a casual at Hudson Central. My brother-in-law, who is in IT, had a few things to tell me about the care. I decided to join the same quarters, data analytics and Python bootcamp. For my capstone project, I decided to search about the benefits of reading. The objective of this project is to show 
the benefit of reading in people's education, employment, and health. The data is sourced from Kaggle's data. This data set covers over 2,800 individuals between the age of 16 to 93 years old. The average participant was around 47 years old. The data comes with 13 columns, and I have to add one more column to show the impact of reading on people with Alzheimer's disease. Since I used all columns, I had to clean some variables such as net values in Excel. As a data analyst, I want to validate the data that I received to make sure that I have all the required information in a format that is acceptable so that I can load the data into Jupyter Notebook to work on the Python code. In this project, I can see how the habit of reading can impact someone's life. For the people who read more books, they either have it a high level of education or the income is greater. White Americans read more books and females read more than males. Married couples read more than single people. As a data analyst, I would like to show some table reports on the reading habit of benefits overview so that you can visualize the data better. I would like to show you visually appealing dashboards with a variety of charts. Um, this one is reading by employment. As you can see, employees who are working full time, they read more books. They read like 5,381 books in the last 12 months. And the next one, they read too many books. It's retired people. They read like 7,988. And this one is reading by education. On this slide, you can see that some college, you know, four years degree, they read like more books, 7,632. And the college graduates, they read like 7,154 in the last 12 months. This is my dashboard. You can see females are reading more books. They read like 29,129 for the last 12 months. And males, they read 18,099 books in the last 12 months. This is reading by gender. And this is reading by marital status. The people who are married read more in this section. They read like 26,342. And the second one here is never married or they are single. They read like 9,500. Reading with Alzheimer's disease. And here, the people who did not read much book, they got Alzheimer's when they got older. So females are read 1,678 for the last 12 months. They got the diagnosis with Alzheimer's. And males, 787 books in the last 12 months, they diagnosis for Alzheimer's. Sorry. This is reading by age. And as you can see, 50 years old, 247 people, they read like 4,983 books in the last 12 months. And 15 years old, people like 215, they read like 3,701. This is the average age of marital status on this data set. Never married, the average age is 28. Singles, 36 years old, this is the average age. And this one separated. Forty six years old. And don't know, this means the people who don't like to 
tell I'm married or I'm single. This is the average is age is like 50 years old. And the divorced people is 55 years old. This one is aged by marital status and no number of books in the last 12 months. 65 years old, they are divorced and they read like 513. And 65 years old, they don't like to tell where they are married or single, they read like 12, 24 books. And living with a partner, they read like 97 books. The age is 65 years old. And married, 65 years old, 1,059 books in the last four months. And never been married, they read like three books and the age is 65. And separated, they read three books in the age is 65. So you can see. This one is age by books. This orange color is employees full time also. The 53 years old, they read more books here. They read, they read like 817 books. And this is retired people. The 65 years old read more, 1,242 books in the last 12 months. This is employed part time people. They read like 352. The age is 22 years old. This one is 35 years old people, not employed for pay, 176. This is, I just show you in the dashboard so you can see everything. That's all I have, thank you.